so yeah, thanks everybody for, for uh, having me here. I'm very excited to be here. I just want to follow up a little bit, tell you a little story. Um, this is the second direct selling company that has asked me to be on their scientific advisory board. And um, the first time I did that, uh, I, I went to my first meeting and sat back in the, in the back, like, like most people do. And I started hearing these stories of all these successful people. And, and, and like John said, I agree that nutrition has to be spread. That word needs to be spread really at the grassroots level because the government doesn't do a good job at it. So I sat back there and I listened to these stories and I lasted about eight months. And I said, this is a really good opportunity. I could do really well with this. And I stepped down from the scientific advisory board to build a business. Um, that was probably the best decision I ever made, one of the best decisions I ever made. And I say that because I, I, I want to reassure you that I believe that you have made a very good decision by getting involved with this company, okay? Um, and I, oh no, only if you mean it. So uh, I, I, I do think that there's, there's a, a, a very bright future for this company and, and, and it's exciting because being in the, in the health and fitness and nutrition industry for 20 some years and seeing the miserable failures that ha has occurred, um, it, it's, it's very, uh, it, it's, it gives you a lot of hope, you know, to see, to see such excitement about this. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna go through this um, uh, relatively quickly, but what I'm gonna talk to you all about today is the role that weight training and um, protein supplementation has in optimizing fat loss and muscle gain, okay? So when we look at weight loss programming, typically weight loss programming consists of cardiovascular exercise coupled with some type of calorie restriction, right? And this makes sense. If you, we know that in order to lose weight, you have to burn more calories than you eat, right? So if you do a bunch of cardio and you, you cut your calories, you create this calorie deficit and you lose weight. That's the idea, that's the theory, right? We know it doesn't work all that well for several reasons. So I wanna talk about some of the adaptations to aerobic exercise, and this is critically important. Anytime you do some type of exercise, no matter what it is, the body looks at that and says, how am I gonna make that easier the next time I do it, okay? The body wants to prevent fatigue. So when you do aerobic exercise, let's say you're a runner, one of the easiest ways to improve that performance is to make you lighter. If you're lighter and you move, have to move less down the road, that requires less energy. So the body says, okay, what can I get rid of to get lighter? And you lose fat sometimes, but a lot of times you lose muscle. And one of the main adaptations to cardiovascular exercise, especially if you do a lot of it, is a loss of muscle. Because if I have a lot of upper body muscle, do I really need that to run down the road? No, I don't need that. So if I lose that and get lighter, now I perform better, okay? And that's great from a performance standpoint, but then why doesn't it work so well when it comes to weight loss, right? I mean, we all know that you just get on a treadmill for 30 minutes and you get off and you're five pounds later, your fat just melts off you, right? That never works. We've tried it for decades, it does not work, okay? So, you know, why doesn't it work? And that's what we're gonna discuss. So, I have a picture up here that shows um, essentially what consists, how many calories you burn throughout the day. So if you look at this bar here, um, this bar represents total daily energy expenditure. That's what that TDEE is on the left side of the thing. So this is all the calories that you burn throughout the day. And you'll see that there are four components that contribute to that. The top of the bar, you'll see this, the, that TEF there, that means thermic effect of food. So when you eat, your metabolism increases a little bit while you digest, and then it goes back to normal. So that's not a huge contributor. The next one is exercise activity thermogenesis. So this is, these are the calories that you burn during exercise, right? Intentional exercise, zero to 30%. Still not a very huge contribution. The third one, which is larger, is non-exercise activity. So this is getting up and walking around, just doing your activities of daily living. Things that are physical activity that aren't intentional exercise. And then you can see that the largest contributor here is the resting metabolic rate, or the basal metabolic rate. So this large bar at the bottom represents 60 to 80% of your total caloric burn throughout the day. That resting metabolism is just you sitting in that chair doing nothing. 
So if you were to sit in that chair and do nothing for 24 hours, that represents your total daily resting expenditure, okay? Now, it, that makes up 60% of your total energy expenditure. So it would make sense that we would want to increase that, right? Because if we're just sitting here burning calories, it would be great if we could double the amount of calories that we're burning just sitting here, right? That would be awesome. Okay. Well, what drives the resting metabolic rate? The resting metabolic rate is mainly driven by how much muscle you have, okay? Now, on the left side of this graph, on the y-axis, you see resting metabolic rate, okay? Right here, resting metabolic rate. And on the, bottom, on the x-axis, you see fat-free mass. Think of that as muscle mass, okay? So you can see that when muscle mass is low, the resting metabolic rate is low. When muscle mass is high, the resting metabolic rate is high, okay? So it makes sense then that we would want to preserve muscle or increase muscle mass during whatever weight loss intervention we're doing because we want to preserve the muscle that burns the most, bur preserve the tissue that burns the most calories. Okay? Now, something happens when you lose weight called metabolic adaptation. Heavy things burn more calories than light things. Picture a pickup truck and a motorcycle sitting in your driveway and they're both idling. Neither one is doing any work, right? Because neither one is moving, but the pickup truck is clearly burning more fuel than the, than the motorcycle just because it's bigger. And people work the same way. The bigger you are, the more calories that you'll burn. Okay? So this graph basically shows exactly what we showed in the previous graph. You have resting metabolic rate on the Y, and you have body weight on the X. And you'll see that as an individual gets lighter, the metabolism falls. And that's normal. That's a normal response. But what happens if, the, if you aren't eating enough and you're doing too much exercise? So let's say you're doing too much exercise and you're eating, let's say you're burning 500 calories on a treadmill and you're only eating 500 calories a day. So you're creating this really large calorie deficit, right? You're not eating enough to meet the energy demand. And the body sees that as a, as a, as a panic issue, right? It's like, uh-oh, what's going on here? You're burning all this, all this energy. You're not eating. How do I deal with that? So the body says, well, if I'm not getting enough food, let's decrease the amount of tissue, or let's decrease the amount of tissue that's burning all these calories. Let's get rid of muscle. And that's what happens. So what you see, if a calorie deficit is too large, you see a fall in the metabolism that is disproportionate to the fall in body weight. The metabolism falls fa faster than the body weight falls. That's metabolic maladaptation. That's what we don't want. Ideally, what we would want is as the individual loses weight, we want the metabolism to stay the same or go up. That's ideally what we want. Okay? And it's generally believed, or it's generally sort of accepted, that that doesn't happen. Okay? Well, it does happen. But we'll talk about that. So let's talk a little bit about diet and muscle. So in overweight people, when overweight people undertake some type of weight loss program, about 20 to 30% of that loss comes from muscle. And that's accepted. That's, like, that's published. So the scientific community basically generally accepts that during any type of weight loss intervention, you're going to lose 20 to 30% of muscle. And if you're normal weight and you're trying to lose weight, which most, a lot of people are of what we would call normal weight, but they still want to lose a few pounds, for those people, they potentially could lose up to 35% of, of their weight from muscle. The leaner you are, the more likely you are to lose muscle during dieting, okay? The more muscle you lose during dieting, the more likely you are to gain that weight back and the faster that weight comes back, okay? So preservation of muscle during weight loss is something that's critically important. So we have to ask ourselves, is the loss in muscle obligatory? Does it have to happen? Do, do we have to lose muscle when we lose weight? If you're gonna untake, undertake some type of calorie restriction, is muscle loss going to occur? That's the first thing we wanna know. The second thing is if the resting metabolism is directly, if the, if the resting metabolism makes the greatest contribution to total energy expenditure, and if 
resting metabolic rate is directly related to fat-free mass. If it's directly related to the muscle mass, doesn't it make sense to use some weight loss intervention that's going to preserve or increase the muscle mass? That makes sense, right? But we don't do that. We hear do a bunch of aerobic exercise. Right? So why is that? Aerobic exercise burns more calories per unit of time than weight training does. Okay? But I'm still going to tell you you should weight train. And I'll tell you why in a second. So the first question, does the loss in fat-free mass have to happen? These are 60 subjects from our lab, weight loss clients, 60 people that we pulled at random. In order to get on this chart, you had to have eight pounds of fat loss. That's the only thing that put you on this chart. So each pair of, each bar, you'll notice that there are yellow bars and there are blue bars. The blue bars represent the change in muscle mass, and the yellow bars represent the change in fat mass. The zero line here is somebody's starting weight, and each pair of bars represents one subject. So the yellow bars, again, the size of the yellow bars represents the amount of fat lost. So, so this bar, 40 pounds of fat loss, 40 pounds of fat loss. Now this individual did have a little bit of muscle loss, but look at this person, 40 pounds of fat loss, almost 10 pounds of muscle gain. Huge change, right? Now on this graph, these are 60 people, 60 subjects. Of these 60 subjects, 15 lost muscle mass. 25% lost muscle mass. Now I'll tell you, when we went back and looked at these 15 people, 100% of them failed to hit the protein goal that we gave them. 100%, okay? So the role that protein plays in maintaining muscle mass is critically important during dieting, okay? Now, why do we do strength training instead of cardio if cardio burns more calories per unit of time? So let's make believe this is a seven-day week we have on our x-axis, seven days, and let's say the individual's RMR is 1,500 calories. So they're, they're sitting at 1,500 calories, and that person on day one, let's make believe it's Monday, they're going to go and they're going to do a weight training workout. And when they do that workout, they break down a bunch of muscle, and that muscle then has to repair. And that repair process is calorie intensive, okay? So that causes an increase in the metabolism up to about 20%, up to about 48 hours, if the weight training is done correctly. So let's pretend that you do that. You'd induce this workout, you elevate the RMR by 20% for two days, it starts coming back down, and then you do it again. Same thing happens, 48 hours, starts coming down, you do it again. What, have we, what are we accomplished here? If, we've, if we have a 20% increase in RMR, on average, and we're able to maintain that, we've essentially moved the baseline RMR from 1,500 calories to 1,800 calories, right? But we're only working out three times a week. So if you can induce a 300 calorie deficit seven days a week by only working out three, wouldn't you want to do that? You'd want to do that, right? You'd rather do that than get on the treadmill and burn 300 calories every day because that's going to lead to losses in muscle, and that's going to lead to decreases in the metabolism. Okay? Usually, or often. Now, a lot, there's a lot of genetic variability in how you're going to respond to this, but for the most part, weight training leads to improvements in muscle mass where cardiovascular exercise does not. Now, please do not think that I'm bashing cardiovascular exercise. It's one of the best things you can do for you, if not the best thing for you can do for you. What I'm saying is, I think that the idea that just doing aerobic exercise and decreasing your caloric intake, it's just too simplistic. It's overly simplistic, okay? If you're gonna do cardio, do it on the off days and don't do it for more than two days a week. These are, this is the, 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 the recommendation that we give to people that, that we work with, right? Cardio is optional from a body composition management perspective, not from a health perspective, but from a body composition management perspective. So let's talk about protein and muscle. The US RDA for protein is 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight. And that's considered by many to be way too low. I only have two minutes, so I got a book here. So protein needs are higher during periods of calorie restriction and during periods of resistance training. And it's been shown that when, in order to maximize muscle mass during resistance training, you need about 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. Now notice, 1.6 is on the low end, and that's twice the RDA, OK? 
Okay? And also keep in mind that these recommendations were not calculated in somebody who's in a calorie deficit. These are for people who are just weight training. So if you're in a weight training and if you're weight training and you're in a calorie deficit, you really ought to be closer to that 2.2 grams per kilo range. This is, this is a lot of protein. So the question then becomes, how do you get a large enough quantity of protein while still staying in that calorie deficit? That becomes the difficult part. Because if I told you, double your protein intake, and you said, all right, I'm going to double my protein intake. I'm going to get 50 grams of protein from peanut butter. Right? Peanut butter gives you like, I don't know, seven or eight grams of protein per 200 calories. Something like that, one serving, 190 calories, two tablespoons, seven or eight grams, something like that. So, you know, if I wanted to get 50 grams, can you do that and still stay in a, in a, in a calorie deficit? You know, can I eat 1,200 calories of peanut butter a day and try and stay in a calorie deficit? Probably not. I had a client come to me one day and he said, yeah, I can't figure out why I'm gaining weight. I said, what do you do? He said, at night I sit around and watch TV. I said, what do you eat when you watch TV? He said, almonds. I said, how many almonds do you eat? He said, I don't know, two, three cups. <laughs> I did the math, it's like 1,800 calories or something like that. Like, you're not going to lose weight, you know? Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the answer there is supplementation. And, um, oh, let me go back here. So the answer here is supplementation, and Neo Life has wonderful products that help with this. So um, the shakes, for example, um, 18 grams of protein. The Sport Performance, 26 grams of protein. These are, these are very good products to be able to help increase that protein intake without causing significant caloric intake. And these products are very well designed um, in that the shakes, for example, are protein blends. And this is important because protein, different proteins have a different absorption rates through the gut. And when you, want opt, when you want to have optimal muscle growth, you want different rates of protein absorption. So these products would have you know, whey, casein, soy, a mixture of those protein sources so that the, um, the digestion rates, you have a longer period at which um, amino acids are elevated in the blood when you use protein blends versus single source proteins. Okay? Um, I only have a minute left, so I want to talk about the, the, um, what this looks like when protein and resistance training are combined um, in the right way. So this is an, a, 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 a client of ours, Mary. I, she, Mary is probably 45, 46 years old. And this is a DEXA scan. So a DEXA scan is a, sort of the gold standard for body fat measurement. And on the left-hand side of the graph, you see that the um, red areas are areas of high fat, the yellow areas are moderate fat, and the green areas are muscle. This is 15 months result. So Mary came to us at 38% fat and noticed that her resting metabolic rate was 1,558 calories, which was 6% lower than predicted. After doing weight training and increasing protein in a calorie deficit for 15 months, this is what happens. So her total weight loss is 32 pounds, but her total fat loss is 45 pounds. So there's a 32 pound weight loss on the scale, but 45 pounds of fat loss and 13 pounds of muscle gain. That happens with an increase in the resting metabolic rate of 200 calories, which is a 14% increase. Now the important thing to look at here, during the first eight months, based on her metabolic rate, she was eating 1,550 calories. After that, from month nine to 15, that increased to 1,957. We had to feed her more to be able to support the increase in protein that she was consuming. Okay? This is what we want to achieve. We do not want to achieve weight loss with muscle loss. It won't work, it won't last, it's not metabolically healthy, it's just a bad approach, okay? I realize I burned through this, I'll be around here for all weekend, so if, if you have any questions about anything, please just approach me. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to help any way I can. And again, thank you for having me and inviting me. I love to be here.